Previously on the Simply Human Podcast. You have the best questions ever. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that clip to Rick because Rick always so makes good. fun of my questions. So I'm so happy that you can send <laughs> No, and I mean it really. I'm, I, I really mean it. Those questions are so amazing. And so it's like a twofold. So when I started this journey, I was like, <laughs> the ego, the pride, I can figure it out. I can do it myself. So I was like DIY girl, everything, asking Uncle Google, YouTube, <laughs> courses, podcasts, books, all of it by myself. It's episode 242 of the Simply Human Podcast with your host, Mark and Rick. Two human beings being human. Our goal is to help you understand how humans are designed to eat, sleep, move, and enjoy, and you can start living more like a human today. On today's show, it is loose, Brett. She's a writer, blogger, a patient, a feminist, a word lover, a pun enthusiast, a self-proclaimed leaky lady, and that woman. You know that woman over there kneeling on the floor searching for her oyster card. That's what her website says. I don't know. She's from London. I might have I might have just said something very offensive. <laughs> Should I, oh, okay. I look that up? Okay, so we just had a great... So let me tell you what Luce did. When we set, up, we set it up through her people, right? I, I did the spiel about we record on this day at 8.30 p.m. Central. Like, take it or leave it, right? Yeah, no problem. Boop, I get the thing. Luce Brett on this night. Da, 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 da. And then, like, she she writes back or somebody wrote back and it's like, hey, just Luce, just so you know, like, this is 2.30 a.m. London time. Are you cool with that? And I'm thinking, oh, well... There goes loose. Like, there's no way. Oh, yeah, there's no possible We're way not anyone would get to... up in the middle of the night to talk to yeah. this. And we, we can't do it at eight in the morning or whatever. Yeah, work, you know what I mean? So, and she wrote back, she was like, Yeah, I guess, yeah, I'll uh, I'll be bright eyed and bushy tailed. I'll, I'll just wake up in the middle of the night and do this podcast interview. And she does. My biggest fear, I was like, What if the technology messes up? Or like, Oh, and she wakes up and the whole oh, thing craps and, out. And and there were a few oh. times that it's kind of going out. And I was like, Oh, God. Yeah, I was <laughs> seeing that. But it never did go all the way out. So she's awesome. We're going to talk to her in just a second. Yeah. Uh, we got to talk about something. Yes. I feel like this would be this, this is a sports thing, but I think it's, it goes beyond sports. Okay. So my brother, Brad. Yes knows a guy i don't know Man. <laughs> that's my i'm story. pumped about this by the way who he so brad knows that i love the mavericks yes and 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 is he's a big he loves giving gifts he loves knowing what people want he doesn't want to give anyone something that they don't want he wants to yeah. make sure it's something cool this guy used to work at the at the Mavs old stadium in the 80s, 90s. Uh, Reunion Arena. Reunion Arena. You, you, you know the downtown Dallas skylight. It's uh, Reunion Tower is the one like the very tall, skinny with the big ball at the top. Uh, Reunion Arena was right next to there. So so uh, he knew a guy that used to work, was like a ball boy, worked it, there somehow. And whenever they tore down Reunion Arena, there was like – some stuff left in the locker room, some stuff left over here and there. And they told that the few people like, yeah, if you, whatever's left, like is being demolished. So take whatever you want. Yeah. So this guy takes all this stuff. The first, the first thing, which, um, I, by the way, I'm coming into town this weekend. We need to talk off air about, oh, yes. but just, but it's just, I'm coming in Saturday. I'm leaving Saturday. We'll talk about it off air, Okay. but maybe like, there's this thing that he sent me. It's like the ticket board. It's like a, a it's a gigantic whiteboard. It's six feet wide by four and a half feet tall. And it has a diagram, like the seating chart of the entire arena. And they had that mounted. It's a dry erase board. They had it mounted in the, uh, the season ticket sales office. So they could mark off sections that were available. Sections were not available. Well, Mark sends me this picture. Well, I literally just bought this house and uh, I'm looking for, you know, cool decor, the the formal dining room, like we're ever going to dine in there. I'm going to like we're getting like an air hockey table. I'm going nice. to put some like sports kind of stuff on the walls. This would be perfect for this wall. So he asked me if I want it and I like I'm doing the dimensions, you know, yeah. and I, like I, and you live three hour, three and a half hours from uh, where this thing is located. So I, this is going to be a pain for you. And I tell Jen about it. She's that kind of gives me, <laughs> of course, you know, where are we going to, no. there's there, yeah, yeah. and like, oh, okay, I'm going to get this thing and I'm going to just put it in my garage behind a bunch of stuff and never going to see it. Yeah. Or we could get it for Rick and he's at, and it's going to be this awesome thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so this guy is also like, Hey, I have some other stuff too. He starts sending pictures of like the the wood engraved name plates that go above the lockers of all yeah. of these maps from the 80s and 90s. There's 120 of these things. Yeah. 
And I, I wonder if I share my screen, um, will it, will it show up on the recording? Because Dang. I want, where'd it go? Hang on. I want to share. I want to tell you. You missed it last night. You missed the 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 draft. So the simply humans own both. Ja yeah. The man without a pancreas, uh, Jack and Rob, my brother. The true reasons why I am Franco Harris a M <laughs> Mavericks fan. Um, we all went in and negotiated a long story short. We all chipped in and bought all 120 of these nameplates. And then now it's like, how are we going to determine who wants what? Because there's yeah, maybe some that there's some really cool ones, guys, you know, players that are, you know, fairly well known, you know, Jamal Mashburn and, you know, Papa Jim Jackson, Jackson, Papa Jones. He's, all right. Can you see this? <laughs> so look, <laughs> we did this last night. I, so I, this is why you're texting me last night saying you got to join the Zoom call. It, it, and this it, is why I'm glad I didn't. I almost, I almost recorded it because it was so. There was so much hilariousness. So I got like I out. Samaki Walker, you got a Samaki Walker. There you go, buddy. So do you know why Jack is E and S? Uh, I was no, I do not. E Norma. No, yeah, okay. All so right. look, I got his favorite go-to name, the Seymour Butts. Uh, when Jack signs me and Mark up for a thousand email newsletters, he uses the name E, like the initial E period, uh, Norma, last name. Like, uh, like just a, a little old lady name, and then yes. Yeah, yeah, so just run it all together. E, together. Norma Stitz. So I got, uh, <laughs> I got Cedric Sabalos, Jim Clemens. I got Brad Davis or Hubert Jim Davis. Clemens had a locker? I guess. He was a, an assistant was coach. coach. Yeah, he was the head so, coach. So look, we, there's two drylings because one is the player dryling and one was the coach dryling. John oh, McLeod, okay. I got John McLeod, coach. Okay, I Rich guess Adam, Richie yeah. Adamato is on there. We started. Brooks like, was a player, and I think he was an assistant coach at some point. Yeah, um, Uve Blob, uh, <laughs> Jay, Jay <laughs> Vincent. We started going through and saying, "Oh, that was a first round draft pick," or this. I yeah. remember this guy. We were like googling these people because as we were getting. Further, and further Infious, who held the all-time yep. record for blocks in a season until your dad's favorite player Lorenzo Williams broke it in like 1997. <laughs> like, of course, Jack got uh, nut. Nuts. Yeah, of course, he got nut. I got grand hold, <laughs> and I got I got both of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, we went through, and like Rob went. Rob, you know, was first pick. Jack was second. I was third, and we just went through. I, there was a, a George McLeod. And this is John McLeod, the coach. Yeah. Uh, Oliver Miller was on here, right here. Rob got Oliver Miller. So anyway, Short, yeah. it was just a, that was just a, James Donaldson is on here. Like yeah. Sasha Danilo, you know why I got Danilovich. Sasha Danilovich? Why did I get Sasha Danilovich? Well, I know he was in the Jason Kidd trade. The big what Jason number? Kidd trade, the first one. He was what, five. And what did you do to your Jason Kidd jersey? Oh, I, oh I, that, that's how I know. I had a, a Jason Kidd jersey. And when he got <laughs> traded, I was, I was, I was beside myself, but uh, so he went to the, the, it was a three team trade. Jason Kidd went to the Phoenix Suns. A bunch of players went from Phoenix to Miami and a bunch of players went from Miami to Dallas, like Robert Pack. And I loved Robert. Uh, yeah, I got Robert Pack actually. And uh, Danilovich. And so I taped over the kid on the back of my Jersey with like white athletic tape and wrote Danilovich. <laughs> and that, and I remember that too. And that's why I got Danilovich. I was like, I'm taking Sasha because of Rick's funny uh, tape <laughs> thing that he did. Anyway. So, the point of all that is to say uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. And it's just Zoom is that we, we probably would have done that if we hadn't like had been all yeah. so like averse on Zoom and all this stuff. So now we got to figure out, A, how to get all of them, how to get them to Jack, who lives near yeah. Colorado Springs. Colorado. I'm wondering if like, I mean, is he going to reimburse me to like ship them? How many, he's oh, I'm sure he would. 40 of these things. I'm wondering like they're like this big. But um, anyway, so that was a lot of fun. And uh it's like, man, we need to do this again. We need to find another random storage unit with a bunch of old mass <laughs> stuff in it to auction off. Um, okay, let's get to loose. Did you notice? Have you noticed? My yes, I was going to ask you what you did there. What I did here too. You know what I? You know what I did? What'd you do? You know what? This is keeping this is keeping me from just uh, just picking at it. What'd you? N nothing. I just I got a hangnail and I and it and it's uh, all all the way around all the way uh, the whole thing is just a bloody and I have to put this on here it's like all right two in front of my two I can't stop oh I do that nonstop you'll watch me on the video if I'm not thinking about it I, there's do you ever get to the point where you have like a, like a big sore because you chewed so much 
every once in a while, not not that, terribly often. There's like a there's a, a diagnosis for that. I've looked it up before. It's very long, but it's like the same thing here. I can't just let a little oh this little flap of skin. I have to pull that down. Yeah, I have it, to fight like, myself from doing that. So anyway, that's why well, I, I keep figuring out clippers in my desk drawer so I yes. you know, so I won't mess with like hangnails. I'll just clip them off and not play with them all the time. This right here, I was cutting open a sandwich roll for my son. Oh. And I, I'm cutting it open because it didn't come split. And I using the knife and I just and I MF <laughs> and he was like, Are you okay? I was like, Oh, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. He's over there calling you. Liberate the sandwich, you SOB. <laughs> Got extra blood on it. <laughs> now grandpa used to eat them. Gross. Did you see that? Did you click on the link that I sent you of that guy in the other? No, thread? not yet. No. Please do that and report back. Okay. Oh, Here's God. Luce. We talked to her about all sorts of awesome stuff, peeing yourself and childbirth and a grenade. And, and I try uh, to not blush every time she uses the term pelvic floor. And she says we instead of, of urine. It was just, she does use a lot of British words like Lou. Yeah. I was Lou. like, hang on a second. And when she said 50,000 pounds, I was like, <laughs> on Google, 50,000 pounds <laughs> to American dollars. That's a 600, or that's 66,000 roughly American dollars. And uh, we talk about the cave of brokenness. Ears loosed. Okay. okay. Like, I haven't told, I haven't told you this, Rick. Okay. Yes. Luce Brett is our guest. Hello. She, Hello. it is, she just woke up. It is 2.30 in the morning where she is. You woke up at 2.30 in the morning just to talk to us two idiots? <laughs> Worse than that, I woke up at one o'clock in the morning so that I could definitely speak to you two idiots. Oh, no. So where are you? Hang on. Let me think. This is eight o'clock. You're, are you in Denver? <laughs> Are you in the uh, the UK? Yeah, I'm in London. Okay, so are we recording yet? We are. We're all. Okay. We're going. I have a question. Uh, yeah. What is the preferred uh, name of your country? Do I say are you from England or you prefer are you from the UK? What is the difference? Wales. No, that's a different country, you idiot. Oh. Yeah. So the United Kingdom has got England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in it. Okay. So do you prefer to say you're from England or from the UK? What's the preferred I mean, nomenclature? I mean, don't tell anyone. I'd rather say I was European, but um, <laughs> I'm British now. Okay. Okay, Rick, I'm very excited about this because yes. I have this. Hey, you've got it. That's amazing. And I've I've been leafing through it, and I actually went down the – and it is – it's everything that I saw online today, It's it's loose. Right, it's not oh. Lu Luce. I'm sure you heard that. <laughs> Luce, Luce Brett. Luce. I don't mind. I'm from a big family. If you call me anything close to my name, I'm happy. You know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm Mark. My brothers were Brad and Jeff. It was always one of you idiots Brad, come here Jeff, and do this. Mark, one of them. Yeah. But I went down the rabbit trail today. YouTube podcast. Rick, you're gonna love this. She went on a podcast and was totally naked. <laughs> Well, and hang on a second. <laughs> Coffee here. I, I love know we're doing this kind of a show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking about that when I was reading about your podcast, funny enough, because of your sort of ethos about humanity. And they are so brilliant, those women yes. who run it. Yes. I, I, two, guests, I, two hosts, one guest, no clothes. Yeah. And it's a, it's a BBC podcast. Uh, and it's really it was really entertaining. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm so excited to have you on. So. Um, Rick, PMSL is pissed myself laughing. That's what it stands for, right? I and feel so, like that book is maybe right up my alley. Then. This is well, and this is, is fun. a biography of me. I didn't know. Yeah. Well, this is the, the, what I'm holding in my hand here is a memoir. It is a book for women about incontinence, childbirth, after child, all, all this whole thing. And now she's on the show with two men. But I think this is very relevant, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk a lot about that. And so in 30 minutes, we got a lot to get to. Um, first of all, we got to do the birthday game. Okay. okay. So, Luz, we do this thing. Uh, I wish I could explain the origins. I just can't. I don't remember. But the long and short of it is Mark and I each get two guesses at your birthday. Not the year, okay. just the day the day in the month. Uh, don't keep a poker face. Don't give us any hints. Okay. Let the record reflect. That I am the only person who has nailed Necessary. nailed the birthday game. I am one out of probably four hundred chances, and so Mark is zero out of four hundred. So yeah. I am the all time leader in the game. Mark is going to insist that I go first to lessen his odds. 
No, no to of, increase my odds. Well, increase his odds from one out of 365 to one out of 364. So I'm going to go with May 9th. Now, Rick, you might suspect that I cheated since I did a lot of research today. I did not. Okay. Scout's honor. If you nail it, I'm going to know you cheated. Yeah, and then I just say your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Um, July 3rd. No. Sorry. <laughs> July oh. 29th. Okay, final answer, June 9th. Oh, you're both very hovering around. It's June the 18th. Oh, man. I was going to say June the 18th. If I had three guesses, I was going to say no, June 18th. I'm, it was next. I had some of my I'm, notes right here. I'm June 26th. Yeah, I'm, oh, you see, I'm a Gemini. I'm a total open book. That's. I'm Cancer, and I don't want to be Cancer. Oh, it's my oh. little boy's Cancer. Cancer's all right. They've got a bad rep. They're all right. We have a bad, we have a bad name for our sign. <laughs> it is a very bad name. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit unfortunate, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so Luz, we we'll have already recorded an intro, um, a more formal intro, but we want you to kind of give us your your version of your kind of your uh, origin story. So, kind of, how did you get to what you're doing today? How does someone, how does Luz Brett end up with this book? That's not just like like I have this book, so it's not just like some book that you're passing out in your neighborhood, right? I mean, like this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Well, I mean, first of all, I always wanted to write a book. Like I did literature, I did English, I I had highfalutin notions. And I guess I'm a lesson in like, be careful what you wish for, because I always wanted to write a book. And I didn't realize it was going to be this book. Um, and I, and this book is a, a femoir, a, like a feminist memoir. Yeah. Ran. It's like sitting on a bar stool, getting drunk, talking about why, like the oldest problem of the world, which presumably started when Eve or whoever your origin story had the first childbirth without obstetric care or midwives and what happens to women's body and a, a woman's body as a result of having children and the lies we've told ourselves for thousands of years about what that means and about so in the current state of affairs we're in it's like that your body bounces back straight away which is a myth because nobody ever bounces back to anything in life right and it's the denial of death and aging and everything anyway so that's what it's about, which is really big, but it's also really small. It's about what happens when you're fair, you're a normal. I was just a normal 30 year old and I was excited and I was about to have a baby. And I don't think I especially deserved to have my whole life turned upside down. I don't think I did anything especially wrong, but I literally <laughs> wrong. Yeah. walked straight in with a big bump. And <laughs> I mean, the next thing I remember is standing in a shower in a puddle of my own wee, staring at this sort of monument to what I had once been and um, having this complete shallow body and I didn't know who I was hmm. and all I wanted was to be left alone and to be held at the same time and that defined me for years because I was just broken because incontinence is like jokes and 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 it's oh, incompetence ha 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 it sounds like oh, yeah. or like talking too much and right. all that stuff but also it's like zipping all the way back to kindergarten or nursery school and being the one who pooed themselves in the home corner and everybody remembers their name the right. kid that went yeah, his name is mark shut up <laughs> <laughs> no but that's i mean literally that's what happened and so at first i was shell-shocked and then i was depressed also and the books also you know i you know i went into the research and looked at it so i've right. looked at everything like there's, the drawing, there's drawings rick yes Oh, there's the, yeah, there's diagrams no, of like that's everything. my kind of book. <laughs> Plenty of illustrations to get through. I mean, as an aside, they're they're quite it, they were quite funny to produce. Yeah, exactly. So that's hmm. do you know what that is? That's a male pelvic floor, which many men don't even think they've got. Oh, I've got a heck of a pelvic floor. We're gonna floor, talk about tell that. you. We're gonna talk about that. But there's also a 10 centimeter circle just as a salutary lesson for like what we're doing. So anyway, it's about all those things and about what happens when your life is turned upside down and how did I get here to having written a book and talking to two guys in the middle of the night about it? Well, mm -hmm. at some point, at about the age of 35, I got more furious and pissed off than I was ashamed. And I started to talk about it. And I noticed that when I spoke about it, other people told me their stories too. And, and the thing with incontinence as well is that it affects like a quarter to a third of the global population. So right. we pretend it doesn't exist when it's more common than hay fever. Hmm. And so... 
and I, when I found that out, I was just like incandescent. And I just had to spend about six years until I found an agent and a publisher who would take a chance on such a crazy idea. And you guys are great. And we can talk about, you said two men, women. I think it's really interesting because there was some, some brilliant champions. Women who get into this are real champions, like ambassadors for me and for the cause straight away. But it's actually, funny enough, often been men who've engaged the most. And in the States, much more engagement than in the UK. I think people are afraid of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's something that you talk about. I can't remember if it was something I read in the book or something I heard you say on a podcast um, about like you, you can't. And, and I have a wife. Uh, we've had we had two um, uh, vaginal delivery children and then a C-section that was because she had a, a placenta previa and was on hospital bed rest for like 82 days, which is actually we started this podcast in the midst of all of that. We were out of town when it happens, we were stuck out of town for three months. It was this crazy thing. And I remember like when, when people would say, cause I get, I'm real squeamish. Like okay. if I see you blood or something, I can't. I can't. And, and people, when, when I watched my oldest daughter, who's now 11 being born, people were like, oh, did you pass out? Did you, I was like, no, I didn't pass out because what I was seeing, I had no frame of reference for. It, yeah. it, was, it was so, I was looking at something, it wasn't gross because I didn't know what it was because right? I didn't know that the human body could do that. And, and, uh, and anyway, I won't like go into the details of my wife. There was a four, it was a forceps delivery. So you probably can lead that lead to some things that maybe Rick doesn't understand, but it was pretty severe on the first one and all that. And so it's just like, you were talking about how you, there's no way to like explain it to someone right? like the whole process it's like a magic trick and it's right. what I love about childbirth is it's like exciting and thrilling and beautiful and incredible and empowering and disgusting and boring <laughs> and alien and the most natural thing you've ever seen and it should happen in a stable like it's yes. just <laughs> the noises well, smell no that, one tells you about the smell uh, right the poop sometimes you know, who knows? It's like meat. Yeah. Now, I will say, um, during the labor of that first one, uh, it was about a, about a 12 hour labor, um, I did open a can of tuna <laughs> in the labor and delivery room because I brought my, I brought a little snack for myself. That is the most Mark Rogers thing <laughs> I've ever heard of in my life. I quickly left the room with the tuna after Jen. Had the reaction that anyone would have. Right. Like, late. What the f? <laughs> and I was also, I was also very cold. I was like, is that, is that cold in here? Is it anyone else so cold? And then after I watched that, and I, I had trained, I had done an Ironman uh, at that point, and I thought this is, this is not even anywhere close. The Ironman is way easier than what I'm watching here, and it's like men that are in the room should be like being whipped. There should be a nurse job <laughs> to just whip the man with like a bone shard whip, the whole pregnancy, the whole labor, just to give him- Try to like even a, things like, up just a little bit. <laughs> my, my best way of explaining like the physicality of childbirth, and I know it's ridiculous because like, if I describe it objectively, of course it's really physical and weird. And you know, if your eyeball socket went 10 centimeters, that would be really shocking. And vagina's smaller than that normally but you know a cannula that you have when you're having an operation or something the little like where they put a little thing in your hand to right i pushed so hard that that flew out like <laughs> that was the level of like wrenching and pushing that it, i pushed it with the tape the surgical tape right out of my hand so for my whole like beautiful moment like that's like a sort of like massive <laughs> blood just spurting everywhere <laughs> and that is just that is you know that is childbirth. You're yeah, like, just it. Who's, who is that? I hope it's not mine. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it's funny. Like, uh, so my daughter was born, the oldest, and, you know, walking over, I've got my little camera and I'm taking pictures over here and Jen's behind me. And I turned to like say, yeah, everything's fine. And what I saw, <laughs> I, 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 again, I was just, I, I, the way I, uh, it's like, Jen doesn't like me to explain it like this, but it was like a grenade went off and it was like, I mean, it was crazy. And I was just, I could, I, I was just like, 
my God. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's anyway. So it's just, uh, hopefully there are some young uh, uh, pregnant women watching this that are going to be really excited uh, to give birth to their babies. Um, here, Here's something. You Actually, go, yes, go. I'm sorry. I have a serious thing on that. I think that we have, part of our denial is not telling people properly. And however scared I would have been. Yeah. And this is definitely true. Like, because I also got a look at the red voluminous uh, cave of brokenness because there was a, 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 a like mirror covered. Yes, the mirror. Why? Yeah. And, I looked up and I'm like, oh. really? <laughs> okay. and, and at first I was like staring at it. It was like, wow, what's that? And then I was like, oh God, actually, you don't take it away. Hey. Um, <laughs> I'm putting, I'm putting cave of brokenness into the show. <laughs> That's going to be my... my... When I finally release a rock album, that's what's going to be the title of the first album, Cave of Brokenness. Bentley solo album. Um, but I wouldn't have changed anything. Right, right, right. Yeah. It would have been better to know because the same thing would have happened because it's very rare for anyone's vagina to be in to be the same, just like we're not the same if someone dies or we're not the same if we fall in love. We change, our bodies change, our brain changes, our thought processes change, our skin changes. Yeah. And I think if someone had been honest with me, properly honest, then all the same things would have happened. Right. But at least I wouldn't have been in shock. Right, right. right. Well, it's like I got the uh, uh, COVID test, the nasal test. <sighs> and the nurse was like, she, she took it out of the deal and she goes, this is going to hurt. And I was kind of like, thank you <laughs> right? for being honest with me. Like, it's like not going to change anything. I just want you to prepare. This is not going to be pleasant. And then she stuck it all the way into it. So there's how that went. Um, okay. So here's one thing. You in the book, I mean, you don't just start with like the incontinence part. You go back to like you know, obviously not like conception. You don't you don't go that there aren't any diagrams of that in the book. Uh, cartoons. <laughs> Rick, gave a, Rick gave me a keychain one time that has had conception <laughs> diagram. For a, Christmas, for a birthday present. Thanks for that. It's still in my closet somewhere. Is that um, on your keys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, but like, uh, well, I always say this, and I, I try to make this analogy, and I don't know if I ever do a good job of it, but it's like when you're sick, what, what do they tell you to do? They tell you to rest. They tell you to drink fluids. They tell you to eat really healthy foods, right? And all that stuff, isn't that like, wouldn't that be good to do all the time? You yeah. know? And it's like, I feel like there are sometimes like things that we tell pregnant women to do or to avoid doing, right? Exercise a lot, get a lot of rest, eat really healthy foods, don't eat like stuff like the deli meats and all this other stuff. It's like if, if it's good for like a pregnant woman and a growing baby, isn't that isn't that kind of good human behavior for everyone? It doesn't have to just be for the pregnant women, right? Is that does have you, have you does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I I I think I think we um I, I've got lots of thoughts. Like I think we fetishize self care to the point where we're saying, but but we combine that with with uh, you know society wide misogyny. So we sort of tell women their self care is like having a bubble bath, like right. being clean, the normal human thing to want to be. That's why incontinence <laughs> is so terrible. Like completely normal to want to clean yourself if you're dirty. Like that's and that shouldn't be self care. Self care, right? <laughs> that way that's like some surprise that a mum can have once every four weeks. Right. Like that is something you should have every day like you know what you should self-care you should eat some food you right. should go to sleep tonight yeah <laughs> it's what they say to women who've just had a baby try right. and get some sleep and have some water really yeah <laughs> that's right. what you say to those people yeah it's and so that's one thing that you know the vitamins everything else like that's it's probably generally good um so uh i want to talk about i know the simply human podcast you know we talk a lot about you know, movement, sleep, uh, nutrition, and then managing stress. And you mentioned a lot. And I was hoping when I opened your book, I thought, I'm wondering, and I'm hoping that the pelvic floor is mentioned at, a lot, and it is. And so a lot of people don't really understand this. We had Katie Bowman was a guest on the show a few several several times a few years ago, uh, and she's real big into into natural movement. And like when you're pregnant, that's not like a a, a, a pass to like lay down for nine months yeah. you need to be yeah. active and you need to be stretching and you need to be doing squats and strengthening that pelvic floor and like getting ready for this like massively like yeah. physical Tra like physically traumatic event yeah. it's almost like like it's saying like sign up for a marathon all right that's gonna be a really hard on you so you need to just go lay down 
and train in your bed for nine months and just eat a ton. And then like what is going to happen to you after the marathon? You're going to be totally destroyed, you know? And so all that to say the pelvic floor, like people don't understand, like if you look at the thing of a pelvis, there is no, it's just muscle and tissue at the bottom. And so like people don't understand, like, like in, in, in a natural human movement patterns, that, that pelvic floor is, is, is usually more, is more strengthened throughout natural movements. And when we're sitting all day in cars and in our office and everything for men and women, the pelvic floor is not even close to being as strong as it should. So talk through us a little bit about the pelvic floor and kind of get into the, like some of the, the biology and everything and things that you can do, whether you're pregnant or not, that are, that will strengthen your pelvic floor that will help you just in your life. Was it? So I'm not a practitioner, so I'm not. A, so I spent a lot of my time almost like the book is about being um, somebody who didn't know anything about it and being like, wow, really? So, I mean, in lots of ways, everything I'm going to tell you is going to be more spiritual than mechanical. Perfect. Because what I discovered when I had a baby was that your pelvic floor doesn't just keep a few organs in place neatly in a sort of bone shell, which is kind of about where I was with it. It holds your whole life together. Right. Because if it's not there, then things start to move. And when they start to move, it affects your continence, but so much more, it affects your sexual function, it can affect, um, it can cause terrible pelvic pain problems. And because a lot of those things are true of men and women, but have been manifest more in women because of childbirth and the menopause, because your pelvic floor is, and the ligaments and muscles in there are affected by hormones. So that's why women are more likely to leak after the menopause than they are before. And that's why like most incontinence is, is uh, the the bit of the population that have the, has the most incontinence is old women. Um, that's why we have those like pissy old lady ideas and jokes. Because of because of all that, it's not been very well looked at. So back there was more innovation in some ways, like hundreds of years ago when um, human diet was so terrible that people had things like bladder stones all the time. And like if you have Samuel Pepys, so every English or British or school school boy and school girl has heard Samuel Pepys. He wrote diaries in the Fire of London, so he's like this huge figure here. And um, everybody knows he wrote these diaries and he buried his cheese so it didn't burn down in the Great Fire of London. And what they don't know is that he had a, a bladder stone the size of a baseball cut out of him oh. without anaesthetic. because There was no anaesthetic then. And um, he kept it on his mantelpiece for people to come and have a look at. And he had a party every year to celebrate finally being able to pee properly. So we have always known yeah. Yeah. that things to do with the pelvic floor, things to do with your bladder, things to do with your bowel are so important. They can ruin your life. But if we don't take care of them and your pelvic floor is a perfect place to start because it's not difficult to look after your pelvic floor. And all the figures about incontinence in particular are underreported. So you speak to the World Incontinence Society, every charity, every set of researchers, every urologist, they say nobody admits it. Because if you're, as my friend Elaine, who's in the book, she's a physiotherapist, she always says, if you're in the street and someone comes up with a survey and they say, oh, do you leak urine? You don't go, yes, and I'd love to be in a research study. Do you want me to tell you more about it? Should I tell you more about it? <laughs> you're leaking yeah. urine right now. I could, I noticed it. Yeah. yeah. Nobody says that. So it's underreported. And it's underreported in young people as well. So there will be young women listening to this, young women, teenagers in their 20s who have never had a baby, never been pregnant, who have pelvic floor issues and aren't doing anything about it because we're not taught at school. If you ask someone to draw a pelvic floor, they probably think it looks like, I don't know, I thought it was like the what, shape of a sanitary towel or something. Right. And it's like a basket, a yep. massive basket with loads of, loads of heft. And um, you can look after it really simply. We've learned to brush our teeth we could do our pelvic floors. And if we knew a bit about it, then the one third of women whose pelvic floor is too tight, which is also an issue, because there's a myth that it's just because you're all baggy. That's not right. Lots of women who have issues because their pelvic floor is too tight. If we knew a bit about it, then women would be able to self-identify the beginning of their problem and get the right help from a physical therapist or a doctor or a urologist or whatever it is. So yeah, there's loads you can do for your pelvic floor. And some of them are things that are like lifestyle things that we're all squeamish about talking about. Um, well, and that's what I wanted, I want, that's what I want to get into. Weight, drinking more water, right. being careful with alcohol and coffee. I mean, I remember I, there's a whole chapter in my book about my sort of fury when not only did I have this awful problem with uh, being incontinent after having babies but I also was quite depressed which instantly is really strongly linked to incontinence right. and all the literature shows that but nobody said that to me so I spent nearly a decade thinking it was my fault that I got depressed when I was wetting myself all the time when actually that's really common 
Um, but yeah, I was really annoyed when they were like, and now, you know, stop drinking. I was just like, what, seriously? No, like, you no, said no. that on a podcast. You said something about don't, in London, don't you get like a, not a stipend, but you have like money that you, after you have a baby or something, and you said something about, uh, I want to spend that money on gin, not on oh, yes. diapers or like something. My child benefit, yeah. I right, to spend right, right. It. Yeah, exactly. On, on Prosecco, not on like bloody tunnel lady. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is a Swiss, but yeah, so, yeah. but it's just so, you're exactly right because it's sort of the sort of thing you would say if you were like okay 2021 I am gonna like improve my life and you wrote down 50 things you're gonna do I bet you at least half of them would be so beneficial to your pelvic floor right so talk about some of those things like uh you know for like squatting to me like this is the first thing if somebody asked me like came up to me on the street and said do you piss yourself and I would say sometimes and then they would say how do I do you how do I string my pelvic floor the first thing I would say is is like getting like doing not necessarily like doing like heavy back squats but just just squatting like just I mean even more simple than that any kind of proper core exercise from like sitting up straight so like the most basic things you learn in pilates are going to massively massively help you also if you've got if you've already got issues then high impact exercise is going to be hard so so it's really problematic because losing weight is really helpful if you've got pelvic floor issues and continence issues but we ignore the fact that for lots of people that means that any kind of high impact exercise, which is much more egalitarian because it's cheap, you don't need right. equipment or gym membership. You could be on minimum wage and you can go for a run. Right. You can jog, and, you know, so uh, you can skip rope or whatever. But um, a lot of people leak, so they don't do it. You right. know, I'm not gonna go and wet myself completely in, in the street. You know, So there are things that are easier on it, on it for you. Like, so for example, swimming, Pilates and yoga type stuff. Right. And that doesn't have to be, you don't have to be someone who earns 50,000 pounds a year and has exclusive gym membership. Right. That can be going and seeing one person and then doing some stuff on your own. Or it could be going and having physiotherapy because a physical therapist, they will give you, what I couldn't believe when I got all the exercises is how they're all the same as stuff right. you do in a yoga. And yeah. as long as you've not got someone who does, you, you know, check that, that the person you're talking to knows about a pelvic floor because it's complex but you know very simple sort of exercises like um learning when you breathe in and when you breathe out when you're doing exercises because a lot of people do their pelvic floor but like i'm doing now they're just like trying to do it and they're holding their breath the whole time that's not right. going to help you be able to like breathe out and breathe in um having stamina is really useful for it because if you are someone who doesn't have much stamina then that's really hard and also like being really careful not to eat things that irritate your bladder Mm -hmm. And like we sort of have jokes about it, don't we? Like you need to go to the loo loads if you drink loads of wine or whatever. Right. But this is not like good for your bladder and it's not good for your bladder brain communication. So you forget, like you get less good at knowing when you need to go for a wee. And these sorts of problems become really quickly entrenched. And then you're not just someone who needs to improve your pelvic floor. You might be someone who needs to keep a bladder diary and right. have Some other behaviours. Right, right. Right. Yeah. And don't get constipated because loads and loads of incontinence is caused by constipation and then people are afraid to say that because that's even more embarrassing right yeah like we have a trampoline and like jen like won't go jump on the trampoline you know and like she's just she's just she's just like no we're we we know mom just not gonna jump on the trampoline because she doesn't want to have to deal with that you know <laughs> she's very it's strong really yeah I, yeah I, that's not me and my from uh, the physiotherapist so she's a character of the book because I meet her and then she teaches me a lot about that side of it and she was talking about we were saying how we should have a campaign where we should just go around every primary school in the world and put a trampoline there and then um, how quickly you would identify how many women have pelvic floor issues right and the good thing with it is is it's shrouded in taboo and secrecy except for it's quite hard to get a group of women aged between 35 and 70 especially if you offer them a jump on a trampoline or a glass of wine to not immediately start telling you about their pelvic floor. Right. So it's right. a dual thing. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. hiding in the shadows in plain sight, but we don't address it properly. Yeah. Well, and I, I can't, we're running up uh, on time here, but there was another point in the book that you talk about, um, and you can go back to bed uh, after this, but um, uh, about how like there was like the black uh, pads, like there were no black yeah. pads for women but oh there's there's one for men yeah yeah oh of course <laughs> men, of course men have, oh, yeah. have the one that makes more sense like they have more options of course they do you know and so uh i just i very you know it's like me and rick are, are men but it's like even our man listeners which we have a lot of male listeners everyone has a woman in their life mom 
you know, wife, girlfriend, daughter, I have two daughters. So like, I want, I, I need to know this stuff. Like I'm, yeah. I, I need, you know, and it's like, so you can have empathy. I think that's a big thing that is missing in our society uh, today is empathy. Yeah, so understanding how the other, you know, what challenges other people face that you may not understand firsthand because you don't face them, but understanding that other people do for sure. Yeah. Interestingly, like there's several things about men that's worth bearing in mind. So men have a pelvic floor. Male incontinence is in terms of um, uh, societal taboo and stigma is probably 10 years behind women's incontinence. So men are, um, the problem is what's happening to men is that they often become incontinent like that overnight. So they have a prostate problem and it suddenly oh, comes. Right. So it's a bit like if you've been in a car crash and you have incontinence caused by a neurological problem, right? Whereas yeah. for women, I was unusual straight after childbirth. I had problems, but a lot of women, they'll have a little bit of leaking, but it will get much worse as they get older and it's gradual. So women put up with it because they just like used right. to it and so it yeah. takes them a lot longer, but men need help. I mean, you don't even, you guys don't even have bins in your bathrooms. Like right. where do you, when you're in a public loo, where, do, you know, so I think there's a lot for men. Like, look at whatever your political persuasion is, look at the way people keep bringing up the potential that Donald Trump might need incontinent pads and like frankly as an incontinent person like i do not need to be told that my continence is what would make me be a bad president of the united states right. or indeed any other country like i've got enough shit on my plate i could do that easily right. it's got nothing to do with my bladder and it's the same with him frankly like him or loathe him his competency as a pregnancy a president has nothing to do with whether he wets the bed or wears a diaper and yet we what you've done to male incontinence has made it like what the a madman or, you, do you know what I mean? It's, right. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that for him would be not even like on the top 500 of Reasons, the list right? of like things that make him, yeah, <laughs> make well, him not all it great. <laughs> it's not even, it's not even scratching the surface for him. Yeah. And, and it's so lazy and it's really right. mean. It's like, yeah. it's people who are vulnerable who are more likely to be incontinent, like all health issues. And that's part of like your simply human ethos. It's like, be kind, man. Like, yeah. yeah. It's more likely to happen to someone vulnerable. Why not be nicer about it? Why are we not just being nice about it? Yeah. And why are we pretending it's inevitable when we could solve it? Because like, that's the other thing to remember, I think, is that incontinence can be cured and solved. Hmm. Like for most people and quickly and cheaply. Because it is lifestyle changes and pelvic floor exercises will give loads of people loads of relief. And then there's also surgery and innovation if they can't. Right. Hmm. Why okay. not be nicer? Wrapping up with a couple of questions. Oh, you have written a book. Okay, what is one book, not your book, we know your book, what is a book that you love that you are like, oh my gosh, you have to read this book? Um, a, a, a book called And When Did You Last See Your Father by Blake Morrison, which is a British memoir, a man about his father dying and what oh. that means. Hmm. Hold on. Uh, let me write that down because I just had a conversation with a friend yesterday whose dad just got a terminal uh diagnosis and he was asking me for resources so what the heck so what's the what's the name of it again it's called and when did you last see your father yeah. i mean it's partly also about whether you actually know your parents like their life to lead before you hey. came born and stuff. but it's 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 really beautiful okay adding that to my list as well um okay and then we asked this question to everyone on the show what is one thing that you enjoy about life or something you do that makes life more enjoyable, a hobby or just- Besides some... waking up at one o'clock in the morning yeah. to do American podcasts. I, I mean, that is great. Um, <laughs> I, I like watching football with my 10 year old, e soccer, even okay. though it's not my thing because I like watching his delight in it. And I like oh. going to the cinema with my 13 year old because that's what, he likes, so I like doing stuff with, I mean, I don't like being with him all the time. Like don't, I'm not crazy and they're locked up. <laughs> but I mean, that's what I like sharing interest with them. So I actually like the process of something I didn't like seeing it through their like, eyes and going, oh, so I can be like, and then the problem is of course they grow up and grow out of it. And then you're like crying every time you see a bus or whatever it is that they were obsessed with when they were toddlers. But, yeah. You know, that's how my, my youngest child, he's nine. He'll be 10 here in, a, in about two or three months. Uh, somehow he got started watching formula one car racing there was a documentary on netflix a documentary series huh. and he got into it and uh Are you into this now i, I am because he is right, yeah, he, right. Wants, he wants to know all the drivers all the man all, all the, yeah. the the constructors the tracks the everything and so now by default i'm into it 
Yeah. I honestly could care it any less, but I enjoy watching it with him because that's you know, exactly what I mean. Yeah. What yeah. He babbles about nonstop. Yeah. Well, I love that too. Like when you first have kids, you're, you're even their babies. You're like, what if they grow up and they're like, they they do something that I I don't like. Then you think, well, you'll just you'll become an expert in that. Like if my kid yeah. plays tennis, I'm going to become the huge tennis fan. You know, yeah. like that's just the, the way it goes. Awesome. And that's why I'm a hockey. That's why I play. I watch hockey because it's for Rick because I like his little the boyish glint in his eye when he watches hockey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome i think we did it uh, i have your website um i'm just going to direct everyone to when you are that woman.co.uk and that has the book link and like all the stuff all the there's a pod there's podcast things that you've been on and if you just go to youtube and put in loose brett there's tons of stuff Can i'm I on twitter as well twitter. Endlessly tweeting and, stuff about continents and feminism and films and, and I, i'm gonna make <laughs> without consulting rick i'm gonna make i'm gonna make an announcement Oh boy. Loose Brett is our podcast guest of the month. I'm going <laughs> to just gonna go ahead and say, I'm going to say that. Oh, well, and what, where are we? The third? The, uh, the you're, second. The, you're the first, you're the only one so far. At this yeah, you're the first guest we've had in December. <laughs> no, no, it's like only the third of December. Or is it second? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're already, you've got it for December. Wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. She's on December 3rd. We're on December 2nd. You got to tell me what happens in the future. Oh you got to give me the lottery numbers. What you got to tell me what happens in the next like six hours so I can. Basically, all that's happened so far is a fox walked over my front path. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you're just, uh, I hope you can go back to sleep. Are you going to go back to sleep? Yeah, I hope, I hope so. I hope so. Or, or I'm going to be really crabby tomorrow. I know. Me meditate or something. And, and <laughs> good state. Uh, Luce, you are awesome. I really, thank really, so really much. cannot thank you enough for, for doing this. Like, I, I wouldn't have done this. Yeah, uh, like last, you when now. I read your description, because I totally agree with you about we're all humans, that's what the end of the book is just like a plea. Like, can't we just be nicer to each other? And Fantastic. remember, we've all got bodies, and sometimes they break. And so uh, that's why I agreed to get up. At, I mean, I wouldn't do it for just anyone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. Right. She's like, <laughs> get up at one o'clock every morning. It's part of my routine. <laughs> it's part of the deal. <laughs> Awesome. Luce, you are great. Um, when this goes out, it'll be video and audio. I have a new computer. And so uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, so it is. Are you at a standing desk? Uh, I'm standing up. Yes. Yes. Um, but I have a standing desk in my, in my, in my work as well. But um, I, uh, I will probably have this done within the week, uh, Rick. Can you believe that? Like, that's how fast it's taking me now. I'm serious. Good. It's unbelievable. I've been getting flooded with complaints about how long it takes you to do this. Like six weeks. Anyway, Luce, you're awesome. Go to sleep, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good day. You're listening to the Simply Human Podcast. That was great. C can you believe she did that? I can't believe. I you. certainly would not do that. I and would not. Even if I had like a book to sell and to promote, if somebody was like, hey, can you wake up at one o'clock in the morning and be on a podcast? I'd be like, nope, don't need your money that bad. Sorry. Screw you. Well, and I was going to say one other thing that you would like about this, Rick, is that the F word is in here. Copiously? The Best of all words. It's yeah. the most versatile word in the English language. Yeah. Um, so she's awesome. And we're very, obviously very honored that she would do that for us. And she's yeah, that's very cool. popular, uh, not just in the UK, uh, but kind of everywhere too. She, and she was nice enough to say, they, they sent me this book. And I have this book. Um, that's where I just, you can just tell me about it. It's fine. You know what? I was listening to an old show. Oh, I know why. Is because we had a listener find the show where we you told the story about the kid who asked me say anything about <laughs> my favorite mark rogers story and the, we we found it and i, I was listening know. to that show and i was listening to that humans being human segment and then it and then i just happened to keep listening and we are simply human tip of the week where we would like find like an article or something and yeah. talk about an article that was we need to do that some more yeah we should yeah, for those who are not familiar, my favorite Mark Rogers story of all time. Gosh, how long ago was this? What is this, 2020? This is 16, 17 years ago, probably. Yeah, 15, 16 years so ago. So Mark's prior career, I actually can, can take significant your video just dropped out. I just see I know. Oh, okay. Go okay. Oh, <laughs> you're picking your nose. This is what you're doing. <laughs> it goes back to like my pants are down and it's like <laughs> <laughs> 
I take credit for this because I got a job in the TV business, small market, Abilene TV, and then I got Mark hired and then I left and then uh, the right people left. And so Mark ended up being like the, you know, the number one guy in the sports department of this TV station. And this guy brought his kid who was like super interested and like some of his kids friends. And Mark is like, Mark is, uh, Mark thoroughly enjoys uh, looking at spouting, sp spouting sports knowledge. Uh, Mark knows the name of every Heisman Trophy winner of all time. You tell him the year he knows the winner in the school. Uh, don't you do the Super Bowl trick too? Like you, I used the Super to Bowl number, I, and you I, can I, tell the two teams and the score. I lost it. I, well, Mark is going off because he knows everything about the Dallas Mavericks. That's another thing I take credit for is I convinced you to love the Mavericks in the early '90s. But episode seventy-nine is. And with, Mark is talking with, about. You know, I know everything about the Dallas Mavericks. I know every single first-round draft pick, every second-round draft pick. I know every roster. I know every yearly uh, scoring leader. Every coach. And ask me one question about the Dallas Mavericks. And this kid's like, who do they play tonight? Mark's like, I haven't looked at the don't schedule. Know. <laughs> I don't most, know. <laughs> it's like the most basic thing you could ask. <laughs> like the, the person who's not a Mavericks fan should know, they would know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, so maybe we'll start doing like another uh, a little tip of the week thing. Uh, but yeah. for now, um, uh, I don't know. What could be the tip of the week after we talk to Luz? Um Oh, stuff about your pelvic floor, pelvic floor, but also what you said at the very end, I really love like do something with someone else because they like it, oh, not yeah. just because not be, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't like that team. I don't like that movie. Or I don't like that show. Do it because like they that, enjoy that, it. That's the yeah. whole like reciprocity thing. Treat others like you want to be treated. If you would want someone to watch something with you, do that for someone else. Man, that would that would help. Um, if we all did one of those acts. Even have to be every day, once or twice a week. I think that would significantly improve kind of the way humans interact with each other. You know, you do something, not, it's not your idea, it's not something you had in mind, but do it because they like it and you do it with them because you enjoy spending time with them, whether it's your kids, your significant other, a friend, a coworker, something like that. So, yeah, I think that's a good, that's a very good tip. Mark gave, us, right. a very, Mark gave us a very, Mark gave us a good tip. Big old nice tip. Thanks for giving us the tip. Big tip. Okay, uh, that. <laughs> that is going to do it for the Simple Human Podcast. And remember. And what they don't know is that he had a, a bladder stone the size of a baseball cut out of him without uh -huh. anesthetic. So until next time, enjoy yourself.